So, uh, kids tend to have a hard time waiting for Christmas. How many of you noticed that? You know, kids get pretty excited. They start anticipating Christmas. And I know when I was a kid, I can remember those days where you're just like, come on, when is it going to happen? I, I can imagine it's only worse these days because Christmas seems to be starting earlier and earlier every year. Anybody notice that? And uh, I, I, there's so much more stuff around the whole Christmas season these days. So I imagine that's hard. You know, it's not just hard for kids to wait for Christmas. It's just hard to wait. I mean, I remember as a kid waiting to grow up. That seemed to take forever. I don't know if it ever really happened, but it seemed to take forever. I remember waiting sometimes for my parents when they were busy, and I was waiting for them to hear me or listen to me. You remember that? Mom, 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 right? And you just kind of, come on. Uh, and none of us likes waiting. Uh, it's mostly a painful thing to do, um, but uh, there is a kind of waiting that, that is good to do. In fact, even waiting for Christmas, you know, uh, there, there's sort of an excitement around that, an anticipation around that, so there's a good kind of waiting as hard as it is. I mean, you ask a little kid who's waiting for Christmas if they're having fun while they're waiting. I don't think they'd say yes. Waiting is mostly not fun. Waiting is mostly hard. Waiting is mostly painful, and yet uh, there's still a good side to waiting, but the real the key isn't whether waiting is good or bad. The real key is how we wait when we wait. How do we wait? What do we do while we're waiting? And we all have to learn to wait because we spend a huge amount of our lives waiting. We just do. Uh, like I said, when you're a little kid, you're waiting to grow up. Uh, then uh, once you grow up, you're waiting, you know, to have, get married. You're waiting to have kids. You're waiting for those kids to move out someday. Woo, right? You're waiting to retire. Then after you retire, you're waiting. You're just waiting, I guess, and waiting and waiting. And then eventually you wait to go home to see Jesus, right? But we spend large chunks of our lives Waiting, and, and, and some of those moments of waiting are, are, are very poignant, you know, when you apply for a job and then you're waiting to hear from a potential employer. Man, that, that'll drive you crazy, right? Just waiting, waiting, waiting. When is the phone going to ring? Um, I've waited with lots of people for medical diagnosis. How many of you have ever waited for a medical diagnosis? Oh, man, that can be torture. You just wait and wait and wait. Um, sometimes it's simple things. We just wait in long lineups, especially this time of year, or you wait behind a car that you think ought to be driving a little faster than it is, or a little differently than it is. Um, there's, there's all different kinds of waiting, and, and as I said, it's hard, but the key is not whether it's hard or not. The key is how we wait, and here's the deal. There is a way you can wait that will actually turn you frustrated, that'll actually cause you to kind of get angry, that will actually create a kind of cynicism, skepticism, disillusionment, hardness towards your heart, or there is a way that you and I can wait that will keep hope alive in the midst of our waiting. And waiting actually has a lot to do with Christmas. Not, not, not when I say Christmas, I don't mean like cultural Christmas, like tree and Santa Claus and presents Christmas, but waiting has a lot to do with biblical Christmas. Because if, as you read through the Bible, especially through the Old Testament, you'll see this great sense all the way through the Old Testament of this building of anticipation. Prophecy after prophecy, message after message, uh, um, symbol after symbol, shadow after shadow of something that is to come. And the waiting in Scripture is a waiting that is a very painful kind of waiting. Actually, as you watch the, the people of God waiting in the Old Testament for the Messiah to come, we watch God's people experiencing grief and despair, confusion and doubt, all kinds of difficulties going on, and yet the writers of Scripture over and over again speak to the people of God and say, don't give up, don't despair, don't lose heart. There is a God who loves you and He has a plan for you. There's a God who, who has promises for you. The Messiah is coming. And in fact, the whole Old Testament is building and building and building to the coming of this Messiah. There's this anticipation, this sense of an answer is coming. Uh, one person uh, wrote it this way. They said, it's as if many different artists had drawn strange squiggles on paper separately, only to find that when their fragments of art were combined on a single canvas, 
There was a beautiful portrait of a king who we would come to know as Jesus Christ. In fact, when Jesus came to earth as a baby, he fulfilled over 300 prophecies right then and there. I mean, prophecies like uh, he would be born of a virgin. Another one that he would be born in a town, a little t forgotten town called Bethlehem. Another one that said he would actually come from the distant past, from the eternal past. Um, prophecies that said he would have a ministry of teaching and healing and miracles. Uh, one prophecy said he would actually have a time of favor, but then be despised and rejected by men and be a man of sorrows. One fascinating prophecy in the Psalms actually depicts the cross before there was even such a thing as crucifixion. Isn't that amazing? It's a prophecy about the cross. And on and on these prophecies go. And, and as you can see on the screen, uh, mathematicians tell us that the odds of one person fulfilling even 60 of those prophecies would be one in one with 157 zeros after it. It's just numbers that would boggle the mind. Our God is a God who deals in waiting, in anticipation, in, 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 in promising things, and inviting us to point our longing toward those promises. In fact, in church history, over the last 2,000 years, this season, the, the, the month of December, the, the days leading up to Christmas, the church actually calls this season Advent. Advent simply means coming. And what Advent is all about is anticipation. It's all about this, this waiting, this looking at the current reality and saying it's not the way it should be, but God will indeed make things right. He does that through the coming of the Messiah. And actually the church, the church has received the Messiah who came, Jesus Christ. He's answered our prayers. He's been God's peace and God's joy and, and God's answer to us, God's forgiveness to us, God's restoring us to a relationship with himself. And yet there's a very real sense in which God's church is invited to once again wait for the Messiah. We call this the second advent or the second coming of Christ. And the church is now, today, waiting for Christ to return and to restore all things and to make all things right. And, and the Bible invites us to wait for that with hope and with anticipation and, and with joy, even in the midst of sometimes days that are hard and painful. And so today, we're going to look at two characters that are right in the Christmas story that are almost always forgotten around Christmas time. In fact, uh, in, in the Christmas story, these two characters are so rarely talked about that you may never have heard about them. They don't show up in the nativity. Uh, they don't show up in any Christmas pageants. Very rarely are they talked about. They're found in Luke chapter 2. And if you have your Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter 2. While you're turning there, let me just give you a little... little uh, tip or piece of advice that's for free. It's not even to do with the sermon. But um, around this time of year... I like to just sit down and read the passages of Scripture that tell the Christmas story. They're found in Matthew and in Luke. You can read, sort of see them in John chapter 1. And, and, and it's worth just sitting down and reading them because it's amazing how much of what we think about Christmas is just culture. <laughs> it's amazing how much of what we think about Christmas isn't even in the Bible and how much of what is about Christmas in the Bible is totally missed. In, in culture. And so it's worth just sitting down and actually going to Scripture and saying, what is the story of the birth of Christ, of God coming into our world? And I, the way our family does it at Christmas time is on Christmas Eve, we sit down around the table and we read the Christmas story. We don't read it all because it's fairly long. And then on Christmas morning, we read more of the Christmas story together as a family. It's just our way of taking it right out of the Bible instead of from Charlie Brown or <laughs> whoever else, right? From Disney. So uh, here we go. We're going to be introduced to two people. Their names are Simeon and Anna. Okay, Simeon and Anna. And we'll pick up the story in verse 25. What's happening in the story is Jesus has been born and now his parents are bringing baby Jesus to the temple to be dedicated. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. He was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, or the comfort of Israel. He was waiting. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when... The parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Simeon, seeing Jesus in the temple just as God had revealed to him, Simeon took him, took Jesus in his arms and praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, 
As you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. I've seen the Messiah. I can die now. All that I've been waiting for is, is, is found in this Jesus, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Quite a statement to make in that day that this Messiah is for the whole world. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about them. I bet they did. You know, they're just bringing Jesus into the temple to dedicate him like you should do. And some dude walks up to them and says, here, let me take your baby. You know, you're like, whoa, right? Don't do that, by the way. Sean and Kendra, they just had a baby. Next Sunday when they come, don't just come up and take their baby. Okay, just let them. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, I just think it's pretty wild that, that uh, Simeon did that. But here's what Simeon says next. To, to Mary. This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. So Simeon says, hey, hey, Mary, hey, Joseph, this, this one, you've been hearing this all along, but you just need to hear it again. This Jesus, he's the dividing line of all humanity. What people do with Christ will cause them to rise or fall. This will be offensive to many people. But you lie on one side or the other side of this Messiah. Every human being does. And this will be a difficult thing for some and a glorious thing for others. And Mary, just so you know, this is wonderful. This is amazing. This is beautiful. But it's painful too. It's going to be a hard journey ahead for you, Mary. So there's Simeon. He's waiting. He's longing. He's he, he spent his life looking for the consolation of Israel or the comfort of Israel. What Simeon has done is he's read scripture. He knows that God has promised. And, and as he looks around at, at the world around him, he sees all the pain. He sees all the suffering. He sees all the difficulties, all the junk that's going on in the world around him. And at that time, Israel was under Roman rule. Israel was not enjoying the promises of God fulfilled. Israel was, everywhere Simeon looked, he saw death and, and, and suffering. And not only that, I'm sure he experienced some suffering in his own life. And so what did Simeon do with that suffering? He turned it towards God and he said, hey God, answer your, your promises. God, answer my prayers. God, show up. In this world, God, do what you said you would do. Lord, I'm longing, I'm waiting, I'm anticipating the consolation, the comfort of Israel. And Anna, who shows up next, she kind of personifies this with her own life. Verse 36, there was also a prophet or a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. So here she is, certainly someone who's thinking about the future. She's a prophetess herself. She's uh, 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 foretelling things and so forth. She was very old, very old. There's a person who's been waiting a long time. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 80 Four. You know what this is saying? Anna was a woman who endured much suffering with her life. A, a widow in those days was somebody who was despised. It was somebody who was uh, completely destitute. It was somebody who had no uh, ability to take care of themselves and no one to take care of them. And, and Anna was a woman who had suffered much in her life. I mean, you imagine her as a young lady with all kinds of hope, with all kinds of ideas about how life was going to go, and then life took a very different turn for her. Only seven years into her marriage, her husband passed away. And until she's 84 years old, she's just been living this life, this destitute life, this difficult life. But what did she do with that life? She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. And coming up to them at that very moment. So again, just to pick back up into the story, Simeon has gone to uh, Mary and Joseph as they're holding Jesus, uh, bringing Jesus in, and he takes Jesus from them, and he prophesies these things and declares these things about Jesus. It would be the rising and falling of many, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Anna's in the temple, and she comes up right at that moment, and she realizes, oh my goodness, this is what I've been waiting for my whole life. And here's what, what happens when she encounters them. 
She gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward or waiting expectantly to the redemption of Jerusalem. So here we have two characters in the Christmas story who both are, are, are personifying, are living out what the whole Old Testament is leading up to. This anticipation, this longing, this looking for a Messiah, looking for a God who would answer the pain and suffering of humanity with his love, with his goodness, uh, with his saving, redeeming, comforting kind of work in the midst of our pain. And, and the, the, the two words that are used, for Simeon, it's the word consolation. Uh, for Anna, it's the word uh, redemption. Here's what John Piper says about these words. He says this, Consolation speaks to those longings for healing and restoration for all the past losses and miseries of life. The people of Israel had experienced judgment and exile with all its guilt, fear, and loneliness, and death. Consolation is when God comes to heal and restore and revive all that has been thrown away or lost. Redemption speaks to our need to be delivered from powers that still hold us in bondage. Redemption is a work of power to save from enemies that still threaten us and certainly to save us from our sins. So those are the things that Simeon and Anna are waiting for. They're aware of their own suffering and the suffering of the world. And really, the truth is, all of us can identify with Simeon and Anna. All of us can look around us at our world and see the devastation and the destruction that goes on in our world. I don't know if this ever happens to you, but once in a while I'll, I'll be watching the news and I'll just stop it and just think, what is going on in our world? Why so much suffering? Why so much pain? Why so much destruction taking place in our world? Of course, that's not only happening all around us on a daily basis, and we don't have to look far across the world to see it. We see it right in our own city. But we don't even have to look that far. We can look into our own lives. And we all have that same longing, that same desire, that same sense of like, uh, God, why aren't things better than the way they are? All of us deal with this. In fact, uh, in a room this size, some of you right now here this morning, you're there. You're in that space. Um, we go through seasons where we feel lonely, where we feel empty or afraid or maxed out, where we just don't have anything left in us. And we badly need the comforter, God, to come. We badly need a sense of God's presence. We badly need to know God's forgiveness and God's deliverance from the captivities of sin and so on. And you know, it's kind of ironic that at Christmas time, Christmas is this time of glitter and lights and joy and singing and all those fun things. It's kind of ironic that at, at Christmas time is also the time of year when many people feel that sense of loss, that sense of what's missing from their lives. In fact, Christmas is one of the highest times for depression, suicide, those different things. Because in the middle of all the glitter and joy and, and excitement, which are good things, we are also become very aware of what's not around us, what's not there, and what's not joyful in our lives. And again, the truth of the matter is, we can try to ignore that or pretend it's not there, but actually all of that longing and all of that suffering and all of that pain, it's very much real in our world and it's very much real in our lives. And the question is, the question is, what do we do with that waiting? What do we do with that longing? What do we do in the meantime well, we're waiting for something to change in our lives and in our world. And I think Simeon and Anna, and this is what we're going to look at with the time that remains, Simeon and Anna are just such great examples to us of how we should wait. Okay, how we should wait. How to wait in a way that doesn't turn you hard or cynical or, 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 or that turn you away from God, but how to wait in a way that actually keeps hope alive, keeps your heart alive, and, and not only that, but brings about the very things we're longing for. You know, sometimes in our waiting, because we turn uh, 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 the wrong directions, we actually miss out on the very things we're waiting for. We can miss the promises of God in our lives. So what did Simeon do? What did Anna do while they were waiting? And we're going to look at three things they did while they were waiting. But what you'll, I find interesting about this, and it's really important to notice this, is that all three things were about motion. They were about activity. You know, sometimes while we're waiting, <laughs> we feel like we're doing nothing. 
You ever felt that way? I mean, whenever you're waiting, you're, you're looking ahead. You're looking at what could be, what should be, what, you know, that thing, whatever that is. And so in the middle of waiting, when you're at a red light, you just feel like there's nothing going on. But the truth is, while you're waiting, lots is going on. And while you're waiting, you're doing stuff, whether you realize it or not. So what should we be doing while we're waiting? Well, here's the first thing that Simeon and Anna both do well. While they're waiting, they are moved by hope. They're moved by hope. In other words, they don't allow the suffering and the pain of their lives to move them towards cynicism or, or just pretending it's all not there. That's what sometimes we're tempted to do, right? We, we see the suffering and we just try to squelch it. So Simeon allows himself to feel that suffering. But then she, he, he says, but my hope is in the Lord. I'm going to turn my attention not towards my pain. You see, what happens to us sometimes in our pain or in our suffering or in our difficulties, as we think about them, we, we sort of spin negatively. So we think about it. Wow, this is terrible. I wish this was different. Wow, I wish. And then it just gets, and, and we can sort of dive into a black hole. So what do you do? How do you not do that? Well, what you do is you keep your eyes on the promises of God. You keep your eyes on the hope that is available to you. Uh, in fact, Anna is, is just so amazing in this because Anna grows old in her pain. Year in, year out. Year in, year out. Circumstances don't change for Anna. She just continues her life. It continues to go. But instead of just saying, you know what, forget it. Prayer's not working. Right? Going to church, not making any difference. I'm just throwing in the towel. Who needs this? Right? Instead of that, Anna was that kind of person who said, even if I die hoping, I'm going to keep hoping. I'm just going to keep that attitude. I'm just going to keep that perspective. I serve a God who uh, 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 promises things to me and He will come through for me. I don't know what's going on. I don't understand all of it. I don't understand all of my pain and all that's happening in my world. But I know my God. Right? I know my Redeemer lives, is the way Job said it. And one day... I'll stand on the other side of this and understand it. But until that day, I'm going to keep my hope in the Lord. You know, I think if you went to see Anna, and I've met people like Anna. You ever met people like this? They've gone through so much suffering, so much pain, so much difficulty, and yet they've kept their spirit alive. They've kept hope alive in their lives. Man, when I meet people like that and I ask them, like we could ask Anna, I think if you went to Anna and said, Anna, you've lived a hard life. Things are so difficult for you. How have you, how have you kept your spirit so sweet? And, and how have you kept joy in the middle of all of that? You know, I think she'd look back and she'd go, you know, I, I have had a hard life. But you know, the truth is, God's been so good to me. Isn't that an amazing statement? I always am blown away by people who've been through tremendous suffering, who will look back at me from their hard life and say, God's been so good to me. Because they've kept their eyes on the Lord. And I think she'd just say, my hope is in Him. You know, in Psalm chapter 42 and Psalm chapter 43, both Psalms, the psalmist is going through very painful things. He's saying, Lord, vindicate me. Lord, I'm, I'm drowning. God, help me out of this stuff. And then as he's going through that, the, the psalmist actually stops his prayer and he starts to speak to himself. And it's such a fascinating line of scripture. He actually speaks to his own soul and he says, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Isn't that an interesting statement? Why are you downcast, O my soul? And, and, and what's so strange about the question is it's obvious. Life sucks. That's why he's downcast, right? His life's going horrible. But he speaks to his soul and he says, Soul, you shouldn't be downcast. Put your hope in God, soul. For I will yet praise Him. I will. God has heard me. God will answer this. In this lifetime or the next, I don't know. But soul, don't get downcast at your suffering and at your trials. Soul, put your hope in God. The Messiah is coming. A Savior is coming. Uh, in the book of Romans, which is really written to a people in suffering, as he ends the book of Romans... In chapter 15, getting near the end, he, he makes this statement in a verse. He says, May the God of hope 
fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him. What happens is God puts hope into your world. As you look at God and your eyes stay on God, there's a kind of joy and a kind of peace that are not dependent on your circumstances, but that are dependent on your trust in God so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I love that closing part of that verse, by the power of the Holy Spirit, because I know for me, in my difficulties, in some of the stuff that I've gone through, I've tried to keep hope alive, and I've tried to stay focused on God, and I've tried to speak to my soul, don't be downcast, put your hope in God, but I have found myself just getting down and down and down, and saying, God, I can't, I want to keep hope alive, I want to not get cynical, I want to not get hard, but God, I can't, and it's right in that place, God, I can't, where God loves to meet you the most. Because it's not by your might or by your power, but it's by His Spirit. Do you see that? You know, sometimes we'll make this little statement in Christian circles uh, that that God will never give you anything that you can't handle. I'd like to rephrase that statement a little bit. I think God regularly gives us things we can't handle. In fact, most of life we can't handle. But He offers us the power by His Holy Spirit to come through it, and not just come through it, but come through it with a peace and a joy that nothing can steal from us. So that's the first thing. Simeon and Anna were moved by hope. They kept hope alive. They didn't allow cynicism or discouragement or skepticism or disillusionment to set into their hearts. They kept their eyes on the promises of God. They kept their hope in the Lord, and they kept moving in that direction. The second thing uh, that they were moved by is they were moved by the Spirit. They were moved by the Spirit. And Simeon in particular, it actually uses those very words. It says, moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do what was the custom, and then, of course, it was there, moved by the Spirit, that Simeon encountered Jesus for himself. Uh, With Anna, it never actually specifically mentions that she was moved by the Spirit, but she was one who never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. And when I read those two things, I I, I think about myself in, in my suffering, in, in my waiting times, and you know, the strange thing about waiting is after you've waited for a while, you want to go any direction but towards God. <laughs> it's a strange thing. But, but while you're waiting, you get antsy. You think, what am I going to do? I'm just bored. I just got to do something. You know what we do? <laughs> we go to the fridge, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'll just eat something. Just, I'm just waiting. So I'll just, right? Or for some of us, the fridge is actually the bar, right? We go to the bar. Um, For some of us, it's just the television. We just go flip on something so we can shut off our brains so we don't have to feel the waiting anymore. Do you know what Simeon and Anna learned to do? They learned to take the longings of their heart and allow the Holy Spirit to use those to drive them to prayer to drive them to church, to drive them into the Word of God, to drive them in that direction. You see, longing will drive you in one direction or the other. Longing will awaken that deepest part of you where your spirit is calling out to God or where your flesh is calling out the other direction. And, and uh, just being honest with you, when I'm in a difficult space, when I'm tired, when, when things aren't going the way I hoped they would go, when, when, when one thing after another starts to drag me down, I feel those pulls pulling at me in both of those directions. What do you do while you're waiting? What do you do when it's hard while you're waiting? What do you do if you're Anna and it's year after year after year after year that it's hard? What you do is you year after year after year, night and day, go to God, go to God, run to God, stay close to God. Let those longings drive you to your knees, drive you towards God. Let those longings be a tool of the Holy Spirit rather than a tool of the flesh. And it's a powerful thing when that happens. There's an action that takes place there. And you move into prayer and so forth. In fact, just we're, we're moving into a season of prayer as a church, J- uh, January 4th to 11th. We're going to be doing seven days of prayer together. And we'll let you know more about that, but we'll be having prayer in the evenings and lunch hour prayers. And we'd invite you to come and join us for those. They're, they're chances for us to connect with God and express that longing and turn that longing towards God instead of turning that lo- longing into other directions. Um, whether you make it to all the 
prayer times as a church or not, um, we just encourage you, participate in some way or another. But allow the, 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 the stuff of your life to drive you towards God instead of away from God. Um, it's one of the most important things we can do. We can turn stumbling blocks into stepping stones when we respond rightly to them. So they were moved by hope. They kept hope alive. They didn't allow themselves to just get moved by cynicism. They, they were moved by the Spirit. They allowed that, that uh, desire and that longing and that desperateness to drive them towards God and towards prayer. Um, and then the last one is they were moved by mission. They were moved by mission. As Simeon encounters Jesus there, he looks at Mary and Joseph and he says, I've got something I need to tell you about Christ. I want to glorify Christ. And not only that, but then uh, uh, Anna, when she encounters Jesus there, she goes, she'll tell everyone she came in contact with who was waiting for the redemption in Israel. Here he is. The Messiah is here. Here's what's important about that for you and me. When we're waiting, again, we can start to sometimes feel like what we're doing in the meantime is meaningless, right? Because we're just looking forward. We're just thinking, well, there's just that ahead. And so what I'm doing right now doesn't really matter. What I'm doing right now isn't really a big deal. In fact, in the church, we say this to children all the time. It's a big deal around our church. You are not the church of tomorrow, we tell our children. You're the church of today. Don't wait till you grow up for God to use you. God can use you right now. Right now, you, you wake up every morning and you're six years old. Ask the Lord, what do you have for me today, Lord? How can you use me today, Lord? How can I be a blessing today, Lord? And let me encourage you. You know, seniors, we have seniors in our church. Seniors. <laughs> it's encouraging, okay? Seniors. You know, sometimes seniors can just kind of think, well, I guess my mission's up. Right? I guess my life is, you know, my mission part of my life is done. Now I'm just waiting. But let me encourage you. While you're waiting, while you're waiting, be on mission. While you're waiting, ask God, what do you have for me today, Lord? You know, I've walked with a lot of people through suffering. A lot of people through a lot of pain. Like, a lot of pain. You know, one of the most redemptive things that happens, one of the most wonderful, one of the most helpful things that happen for people in their pain is when they see God using their pain for mission, for something bigger than them. When God turns their test into a testimony, right? When God turns their difficulty, their suffering, their trial into something that can be used to bless or help or serve somebody else. Not that God caused the pain so that that could happen, but that God can use the pain, that God can turn evil for good. And I'll tell you, it is one of the most wonderful and glorious and beautiful things that happens to people while we're waiting, while we're not there yet, but still in our difficulty and saying, but God use this. In fact, some of, the, some of my heroes have been people who have been going through stuff month in, month out, year in, year out, and yet they've kept hope alive and they've kept seeking God and, and they, they, they've come around and just said, God's still faithful, God's still true, God's still been good to me. And I look at them and I go, man, if you can keep that attitude in your pain, then how much more should I be able to? And I'll tell you, uh, for some of you, life has not been dealt you in, in an easy deck of cards, Right? But I'll tell you, you can take that and you can say, God, I'm going to keep my hope in you. God, I'm going to keep laying hold of your promises. God, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to keep being led by your spirit. I'm going to keep seeking you. I'm not going to allow this to tear me down or take me down the wrong path. You know, sometimes we use our pain as our excuse, right? We say, wow, it's because I went through this or I went through that. And so therefore, this is why I do all the things I do. What if we used our pain as a launching pad towards God? Towards what? the better things that God has for us. In fact, the, the, the greatest saints I've ever known have been the people who've been through some of the most suffering people I've ever known. Isn't that interesting? Taking the same pain and instead of allowing it to drive them in that direction, they allowed it to drive them in this direction. What an incredible, incredible thing. And what a testimony. What a, what a ministry that is. So we, we wake up every day while we're waiting and just say, Lord, what is it for me this morning? Where do you have for me to go? Who do you have for me to talk to? Who do you have for me to encourage? Who do you have for me to pray for? Um, what's my mission in the meantime? 
What's my mission? And God is obviously delighted to use us at any time. So the longing of our hearts, of each of our hearts, and all of us feel this, for consolation, for comfort, for redemption, or rescue, here's what you need to know. It's a longing that nothing in this world can satisfy. Really, it's a longing that's pointing you to the Messiah. And when you allow yourself to be moved by hope in the midst of that longing, by the Spirit in the midst of that longing, by mission in the midst of that longing, you'll find yourself moving towards Christ. And, and, and the amazing thing about God is just like the psalmist said in Psalm 43, I will yet praise Him. Here's Anna, 84 years old. You know, I don't think Anna looked back at her life and said, said what a waste. I think Anna went, yes! Here I am, 84 years old. And I've met the Messiah, right? God is a God who does answer prayer. He is a God who does fulfill promises. Not in our time, not always in our way. But I'll tell you, He knows you better than you know yourself. He longs to hear you and answer you and comfort you and be your Redeemer more than you long for it yourself. And whatever your waiting is, you know, for some of us, um, we grow up and then we think, I thought I'd be married by now, right? And we wait and we wait. For some of us, we get married and then we say to ourselves, wow, I thought marriage would be a little different than this. And we wait, you know, hoping things change. For some of us, we think, man, I, I thought marriage wouldn't end in divorce. And that's a whole painful journey. You see, all of us face stuff. For some of us, our kids are grown and we look at the direction of their lives and it's breaking our hearts and we're waiting. And we're calling out to God. The question isn't whether you'll endure some of these things. The question is, what are you going to do while you endure them? And I think Simeon and Anna are just a beautiful example of what to do while we're waiting for Christmas or we're waiting for the Messiah to come in the various ways that he comes. Let's stand. We're going to close in prayer.